Grace and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Every single week, there are so many decisions to be made, ethical choices, responsibilities to carry out. Just this past week, there were so many areas of my life where I had to make an important decision. Was I going to let my college-age daughter keep the stray cat that she had found on the side of the road? Or would somehow this stray cat be a part of my family? (laughs) I had a conversation with a member of our congregation who uh, who wanted to pursue greater service of mission and ministry in our congregation. I met with someone else to talk about an important health care decision that they were struggling with. And on Monday, I had the hard decision of whether or not I should go to Steelers training camp, even though it was threatening to rain. I didn't go, and of course, it stopped raining right at 3 o'clock when they had the practice. It never ends for us. There are choices to be made, important choices, in every aspect of our life, family, relationships, church, school, work, prayer, exercise, marriage, food, clothing, emotions, thoughts, beliefs, values, priorities. Oh my goodness, what are we to do? How do we keep up with making all of these decisions? Should we even try? Or maybe we should just go home, turn on Netflix, and binge watch dystopian end of the world alien invasion movies all day. To be human is to be confronted with ethical decisions and morality. Ethics is what helps make life beautiful, purposeful. Righteous, good. Ethics helps make life livable in peace, justice, and love. Albert Schweitzer, the Nobel laureate, said, Ethics, too, are nothing but reverence for life. That is what gives me the fundamental principle of morality, namely that good consists in maintaining, promoting, and enhancing life, and that destroying, injuring, and limiting life are evil. This week, we heard the story of the second act of last week's Bible story from 2 Samuel, the story of Bathsheba and King David. When all of the other kings go out to battle, David instead decides to lounge around the palace on his rooftop from that high place where he can look at the rest of the city. The palace was a sign of authority but also responsibility for the protection of his people. And yet over on another rooftop he sees Bathsheba. He sends his soldiers and he takes her. And then he takes her. He tries to cover it up and finally orders the death of her husband, Uriah. What's amazing about that story is the complete lack of moral reflection on the part of David. One sin leads to another. Desire leads to adultery, which leads to cover-up, which leads to murder, which leads to uncovering an accusation. And well, the busting of David. It was Uriah Gate. Well before all of the other gates, Iran Gate, Travel Gate, Deflate Gate, or the original Water Gate. We see the ugliness of human sin. And how often have we seen it before in kings 
or elected officials or sports figures or movie stars or producers, even in pastors and priests and other good Christian people. David did it in the words of a former president because he could. Or in the words of Walt Disney's young philosopher, poet, king, Simba of the Lion King, oh, I just can't wait to be king. No one saying, do this. No one saying, be there. No one saying, stop that. No one saying, see here. Free to run around all day. Free to do it my way. That sounds like King David. It sounds like us. David has let betrayal and violence loose in his household and family and in Uriah's family as well. And like so many sins, when you let them loose, you may not be able to put them back into their cage. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And his method of enlightenment would be the prophet Nathan. Nathan, that same guy from a couple weeks ago, the yes man. He becomes the one who confronts the king, always a dangerous proposition for a, po- for a prophet to confront the king. You could lose your life over that after all. But Nathan does it in a way that offers a learning moment for David. Rather than confronting him directly, he offers a parable much in the same way that Jesus would do. It's the story of a rich man who takes a sheep for a poor man. And David, who is used to being judgmental and offering pronouncements, steps in with righteous indignation. As the Lord lives, he says, the man who has done this deserves to die. And in a moment of supreme drama, probably the best dramatic moment in all of Scripture, Nathan says, perhaps with his finger pointed, you are the man. Nathan declares that, God, that David has despised God's word. If you think about it, he probably broke at least four of the Ten Commandments, coveting, stealing, adultery, murder, just to start with. And in the Old Testament, the Torah, the law of the Bible, has very high expectations and restraints on the king. And David, by his actions, has undermined his moral authority. He is nothing less than a hypocrite. And his crimes deserve death. But God loved David, even as he hated what he had done. And God does not turn a blind eye to our sins. Sometimes people want to say that it doesn't really matter after all. God doesn't really care what we do. But David finds it doesn't work like that. God does care about him. And because he loves him, God judges him and lets him know it. Like a parent who feels betrayed at a child's behavior, God launches into, after everything that I have done for you, why, David, why? How do you respond when confronted with your sins? Do you make excuses? Well, I didn't mean to. Or place blame? Well, society's been so hard on me. Or just ignore it? Well, I don't care. Or perhaps argue. It wasn't me. Or do you acknowledge it? I have sinned against the Lord. That's what David does. 
ethical behavior begins with self-reflection. Looking in to your own soul and your own actions and thoughts, learning and growing from what you have done, both good and evil. Reflection leads to discernment, which leads to deliberation, thought to action. And when we do that, it helps shape our life, not just what is the next thing that we're going to do. To an Israelite way of thinking in the Old Testament, confession means facing and acknowledging the facts. I have sinned against the Lord. And there is no such thing as personal sin. Sin touches everyone. When a CEO gets too greedy, our whole economy goes into recession. When a husband or wife commit adultery, it destroys two families. When a drunk driver goes out on the, on the road, lives can be destroyed. And when people buy drugs in America, children die in a shootout in the streets of Mexico. How many examples can you think of? We are in relationship with each other, connected like a web. Each movement sends a wave through the system. And we are human beings in a relationship with a loving and demanding God of the Bible. We cannot be Christians on Sunday and then non-Christians the rest of the week. What you think, what you say, how you act to your brother and sister in Christ and to the people around the world matters. It matters to God and it matters to them. And if left to ourselves... Our human nature with unrestrained desire and lust for power, the world, our lives, would be an unmitigated mess. But God won't put up with it. And we see through history the fall of those who try to get away with it. Sins have consequences, as David experienced firsthand. But God also has mercy on David and on us because that's God's nature. May we turn from our sin and live. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.